All right, guys, welcome to your next flipped classroom lecture. This lecture is an overview of chapters 7 through 12 of Going After Catch Out. We're going to be looking at the key events and pointing out some important details uh, and giving you a little bit of outside information in the process as well. It's going to be a little bit more text on screen than normal this time around because there are some important things and I don't want to have to worry about misspelling words or forgetting something. Uh, so make sure you're taking good notes. And here we go. Chapter 7, Riding the Road to Paris. So since this is a Paris chapter, we know that it is a fictional chapter. It's one that's made up, uh, one that's going on inside Paul Berlin's head. Chapter 7 uh, is where we see Sarkin and Berlin, and we really see their romance start to begin. Uh, I'm going to put it in quotes because, as we know, Sarkin's not real. Uh, she is inside Paul's head, and she's kind of his... Uh, his vision of what he thinks uh, a girl should look like, or that what his girlfriend should look like, we could say. In addition to that, Paul's imagination is already starting to cause him a little bit of trouble. His story's already starting to get a little bit out of hand. Uh, his sense of duty, which is personified in his imagination by the lieutenant, doesn't want Sarkin to come along. His sense of duty points out that the war is no place for a woman, and she shouldn't be there, and that she's really not fit for this story. However, his desire for love and understanding, uh, as shown by the character of Sarkin, he really has this strong desire to be to be loved, to be understood, to have someone care for him, and so he kind of has this conflict going on between these two things, trying to figure out which one he will follow, which one he will uh, listen to. Obviously, Love and understanding wins out. He leaves his sense of duty behind. Throughout this chapter, Ketchout is leaving them uh, what we're going to call breadcrumbs. Uh, they're actually M&Ms, kind of the modern-day breadcrumb, I guess. And we can see this as Paul's kind of unconscious desire to go AWOL, to, to follow in Ketchiato's footsteps, literally following Ketchiato through the trail of M&Ms, representing Paul's own desire to be doing the same thing. Chapter 7 is kind of strange because at the very end, Stink catches Ketchiato. He screams, I got him, and jumps at him, and it says that it was true that he does. Clearly, this ends up not being the case, but it's kind of interesting as to why, in Berlin's own imagination, he lets them catch up to Ketchiato when we already know that he wants him to be escaping. And we'll come back and talk about that in the next chapter that has to do with Paris a little bit later on in the presentation. Chapter 8 is another observation post chapter. It's nearly 1 o'clock by now, so past midnight into the, uh, into the early, early morning hours, I guess we could say. Kind of an interesting piece of sarcasm here. We're told Berlin's greatest or bravest moment is when he climbs down the ladder and walks out into the sea and goes to the bathroom, uh, stands in the sea and pees. Um, and it is called his bravest moment in the text, which is really just kind of an interesting thing in terms of if that's really his bravest moment or if Tim O'Brien is just being sarcastic. Uh, we're also told in this Observation Post chapter that Berlin is excited by the possibilities, but still in control of his story, that he is telling this story and there are all kinds of options for him, and he really has a sense of power, because uh, if you think about it, he really sees himself as, as creating this, this alternate reality. He's going to tell a story that gets Cacciato to Paris, he won't have been killed, and if he can do that, that really, that's, that's a pretty heady accomplishment, that's a pretty impressive accomplishment. So he really does have this sense of power right now, excited by the possibilities, but he still feels like he's in control. Uh, we're also told that his dad told him before leaving for the war that he needs to look for the very best possible outcome. We can kind of see everything going on in this story as Berlin misinterpreting what his dad told him to do and kind of not understanding what he said or taking it way too seriously and really looking so hard that he's actually creating the best possible outcome because he wants so desperately for there to be a best possible outcome. Chapter 9, How Bernie Lynn Died After Frenchie Tucker. This is a real-world chapter. This is taking place before Cacciato was dead. Uh, and this is showing us some of Paul Berlin's life uh, 
with third squad. Bernie gets shot, dragging Frenchie out of the tunnel uh, after he, Frenchie, was shot. Uh, and this chapter takes place, Bernie is alive, but he is in the process of bleeding out. He's been shot through the throat or through the face because uh, he was in the tunnel, so you can't really get shot anywhere else. The tunnels are, are tiny, tiny little small tunnels that you crawl into. So you can imagine a tunnel just big enough to fit your body inside, but without any room to move around, and then getting shot like that and having to be pulled out backwards after that happens. That's what happens to Bernie. Chapter 9 is where we see a lot of the conflict start to brew, because Lieutenant Martin, as he's calling in for the rescue chopper, is giving their coordinates in code in case any of the VC, in case any of the Viet Cong army is, is listening in on their radio transmissions, he gives the coordinates in code. So rather than just say that we are at X and Y, he has a complicated system where X is plus 3 minus 2 and divided by 7 plus the day of the week, and that's how he gives his coordinates. And this just infuriates Oscar. He is livid at what Lieutenant Martin is doing because one of their squad mates is bleeding out on the ground. The quicker the chopper gets there, the quicker they can save him and maybe even possibly have saved his life. And so this is the first time that we really see uh, Lieutenant Martin's adherence to the SOPs create an issue in the squad and his unwavering desire to do what the book says to do, uh, the book being the, the rules of the army. And the first time we see the conflict start to brew in the, uh, in the members of 3rd Squad. Something else kind of interesting, Oscar, or not Oscar, excuse me, Doc is giving Bernie M&Ms um, as he's laying there bleeding out, asking him if he wants more and putting them under his tongue and treating them like pills. The reason for this is Doc knows, like, Bernie, Bernie is not long for this world. Bernie is going to die. And they're in the middle of the jungle. Doc cannot afford to waste any medicine on a character, on a person who is going to die, who doesn't have a chance of survival. Getting shot in the face in the middle of the jungle, chances of survival not that great. And so he gives Bernie these M&Ms kind of as a placebo, uh, as, as a fake, as a way to make Bernie still feel good as he's dying. Bernie's probably not in any condition to know that he's receiving m and so he's going to think he's getting the medicine. He's going to think he's feeling better, and then he'll die a little bit happier, and Third Squad won't have wasted any medicine on him. It's kind of one of the brutal realities of trying to save someone in a war zone is that you have to make decisions like that sometimes. You have to lie to people to save the medicine for the rest of the squad. Chapter 10, A Hole in the Road to Paris. This is back to our fantasy of Paul Berlin. We find that Stink's attempt to capture Cacciato just resulted in him getting bitten by Cacciato, which is just a weird series of events and brings up all kinds of questions in terms of how do you accidentally get bitten by someone you're trying to capture and all these different things. Knowing that this is all taking place in Paul Berlin's head, we can really see Stink as kind of representing a couple of things, a couple of tendencies, especially tendencies that young men tend to have. And that's one, getting ahead of yourself and kind of jumping in. You may have heard someone say the phrase of like, oh, you got bit by that, didn't you? And this idea of kind of having an unexpected outcome because you weren't fully anticipating what could have happened. Stink more generally kind of represents the enthusiastic but unskilled members of the army of society in general. We can see a lot of that actually later on in the book on in chapter 39, whenever he's trying to speak Vietnamese, but he just ends up screaming at the Vietnamese people and shooting his gun until they do what he wants, and then turns around and is very proud of what he just accomplished. And so in Paul Berlin's mind, Stink is kind of this representative of this young, gung-ho, a little bit crazy kid uh, who kind of gets himself into these weird situations. Chapter 10, again, is where we see Paul Berlin's story kind of get out of hand. Uh, he can't think of a way to keep Sarkin with him. Lieutenant uh, Corson, his sense of duty, has told him that he has to get rid of her, that this is no place for a girl, and so it simply happens. Uh, he opens up the hole, and they all fall into the hole. Well, just one hole, not two. This is an allusion to maybe a very famous children's story that you may have seen the movie of or possibly even read the book of. 
Um, this is an allusion to Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, very popular. Look up a clip on YouTube if you're interested. Uh, deals with a little girl falling down a rabbit hole and entering this very crazy world where nothing makes sense and characters are confusing and backwards and everything's a little bit strange. Um, this falling down a hole has kind of become in in novels always an allusion to Alice in Wonderland because so much of what happens in Alice in Wonderland is just so flat out kind of strange. And so anytime we see characters kind of falling through a hole, we immediately want to think about Alice in Wonderland, especially because what happens in the hole is very strange. The characters they meet, kind of the things that happen, the command center that's under the ground, all those things are kind of strange. So this is, again, Tim O'Brien's way of kind of winking at the reader, of kind of giving clues to the reader that this is not just your basic war story, that there are weirder, kind of stranger things going on here. Chapter 11, Fire in the Hole. This is the one that starts with Jim Pedersen being dead. Remember that he was shot by the uh, helicopter. Shot by the door gunners, actually. We don't quite know what happens. We arrive after he's already been shot. Um, we see him get off the helicopter in, chapter, uh, in a later chapter. And we know that they're near, near the village of Hoi An. The village didn't have anything to do with Pedersen's death. Pedersen was shot by the door gunners on the helicopter. However, 3rd Squad calls in an airstrike on this innocent town. Uh, and it says that they had alternating rounds of what they call Willie Peter and H.E. Uh, Willie Peter is shorthand for white phosphorus. It's kind of army lingo for white phosphorus. White phosphorus is a nasty, nasty tool in the army. Uh, phosphorus, when it burns sticks to things. It sticks to organic material. Uh, this picture up here is actually a picture of a man with white phosphorus burns. You can see them kind of all over his back. It sticks to the flesh and it will burn into the flesh. It sinks into the flesh as it burns. And if that weren't bad enough, your body then actually absorbs that phosphorus and phosphorus is a, is a toxin. Too much phosphorus in your body is poisonous. So if having these giant holes in you doesn't kill you, the excess phosphorus in your bloodstream and in your skin can. In addition to the Willy Peter, if that weren't bad enough, they're also calling in high explosive rounds, which are just the basic fragmentation round of the artillery. It's not a grenade, but it is a, it's a large shell that is fired and then it explodes into shards and those shards then travel further and cause more and more damage. If that weren't enough, after they've called in this airstrike, they then just line up and begin firing their machine guns down into this town. And this is the whole end of chapter 11. Uh, Hoi An is an innocent town. Nothing, there is no indication that Hoi An had anything to do with Jim Pedersen's death or with anything that happens to the third squad. And they just completely destroy this town just out of anger at what happened. And then it says at the very end that they begin to talk about it, and it was always better to talk about it. And this is such a sarcastic piece that we have to feel like Tim O'Brien saw something like this happen in the war. This is one of the times in which we can really see the author kind of showing us some of the things that happened in the war and how deeply, deeply impactful they must have been for those soldiers, that kind of anger and frustration they must have felt in order to do something like this to a completely innocent village. Chapter 12, I realize now that I don't have the title up here, but it is an observation post chapter. Uh, it's now 2.15, so we're now an hour and 15 minutes past our last observation post chapter. This is one where we really start to see Paul Berlin outline the reasons for a lot of his actions. And it comes down to one thing. Paul Berlin is motivated by courage. If he has it, when he'll get it when he'll know he has it, how he'll have a chance to show it. He's obsessed with this idea of being brave. And he really feels like he has the potential for courage given the right conditions. And he mentions this several times, and we'll come back to this at the end of the novel as well, that he feels like there's a silver star twinkling somewhere inside of him. Uh, this is the silver star. It is an award given for bravery. And it is kind of the way that Paul Berlin could prove to everyone, his father included, that he was brave, that he went to the war and accomplished things. 
the silver star really is kind of the motivating thing for Paul Berlin. He really wants to be able to get it to show it off to have claimed that he went to the war and was brave, that he was not afraid, that he was not scared. As we know, Paul Berlin never really does manage to get that silver star. He never manages to act in a way that's brave, despite wanting to so badly, which is kind of an interesting dilemma that he has to deal with. That brings us to the end of chapters 7 through 12. Lots of very interesting stuff happens in these chapters, including uh, allusions to Alice in Wonderland, uh, Ketchado leaving them a trail of M&Ms, which is an, an allusion to Hansel and Gretel, which I forgot to touch on, but definitely an allusion to Hansel and Gretel there. And then some of the violence that soldiers in Vietnam perpetrated on innocent Vietnamese people because of their own frustration and anger. So lots of very interesting stuff in there. I hope you guys took good notes. Please make sure you complete the quiz after watching this video. And have a good night. Mr. Miller out.